Are you there? I am here. Is that any so better? So you are. It's <laughs> exactly what it needs to be, no more and no less. Oh, that is rather excellent. How's all with it you? It is. All, all good. Oh, well, all's well, thanks. I hope the same for you. Yeah, I'm not too bad. Hey, thanks very much for doing this. I really appreciate it, man. It's great to yeah, talk to you. Great no to problem. talk to you. Where, where about to well, you? Thanks, same here. Where about you in the uh, world? I'm in uh, British Columbia right oh, now. Oh, cool. Wow. Yeah. Savage. Yeah, exactly. Have you been? Yes. We well, uh, used to live in Canada. Oh, not Canada. You're in Canada. You used to live in uh, LA, yeah? That's right, yeah. Oh, right. What, when did you move? I've been here for um for a year and uh, two months. Oh, cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, you were kind of working remotely, so you can kind of be anywhere, can't you? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I'm assuming from your accent that you're in Ireland. I am. Well spotted. Well spotted. Have in you which been... part? I'm on the west coast in Sligo. I knew you were going to say Sligo. Really? <laughs> really? Honestly? Um, when you said west coast, I was like, he's going to say Sligo. Man, I'm, impre- <laughs> I'm, imp- I'm just impressed you know Sligo. I love Sligo. It's great. Really? Wow. Have you been? How many times have you been here? I've only been once. I spent a lot of time in Dublin, but it, more, way more. Yeah, about the same amount in Westmeath, right? In Mullingar, and uh, oh, you were recording the blizzards, was it? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what... Um, I I love I, I yeah I love it. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Yeah, Irish people were pretty chilled out. Like, we were pretty easy to get on with. That, that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm. That's that's all I found. Yeah, I <laughs> loved it. I thought it was great. What what, what part? Know. What part of Sligo were you in? Um, I don't recall, but it was definitely a place where you would go for a holiday. Okay. Uh, actually, went to. Um, I can tell you exactly where we went. We kind of. We drove along the beaches because we wanted to see a bunch of Neolithic relics. Okay. And we went up the beach to a point where uh, where centuries first saw the, the Spanish Armada coming oh, to invade. Oh, okay. I know. I think I know. Yeah, that's, I'm close enough to there. I'm in Innisgrown. I'm in a little beach town as well. So a little surfer town. Oh, so. man. Sweet. Just grab it's your board. So- Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, it, it is really Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Being by the sea, I, I get weird when I'm not beside, beside by the sea. It's kind of an odd. You know, when you grow up beside the sea, you're kind of like used to that. You're like, oh, shit. And then when you're not beside the sea, you kind of feel uneasy. I'm sure it's for people who yeah. grow up in cities, you know what I mean? So, yeah. You know, but, yeah uh, I just, grew up in a city. I don't miss it. Really? <laughs> you're New York, yeah? That's right, yeah. Well, what was yeah. that like? That must have been pretty, pretty intense. It was pretty intense. I mean, it was great. There were things about it that were fantastic. I mean, it was. It could be pretty scary at times. Yeah. But uh, it was, you know, I mean, I, I grew up, I think, in sort of like the last great period in New York City history. I think it was all downhill <laughs> after that, pretty much. I mean, it was a real cultural center when I grew up. And it was like, it was kind of lawless. Yeah. And... You know, the place was falling apart at the seams. So it was fun. You know, like I said, it was scary. You could get yourself killed if you really tried hard enough. <laughs> well, at least you weren't you know, trying. That's a good <laughs> um, I, You know, I did a couple of things that I oh, probably did... shouldn't have. But, oh, yeah, well. you know, it was I came close, you know, occasionally, but. <laughs> then again, I, I I didn't know very many people who didn't. You yeah, know. yeah. It was, you know, it was a great time. It was a great time to be in New York to be an artist, which mm. of course now is it's the last place you want to be oh, if heard. you're an artist. Yeah, which is kind of tragic because I think that's part of New York's legacy. That whole, you know, the the bohemian lifestyle and just you know a bunch of shiftless near do well artists, you know, yeah. going. Going to the West Village and having coffee and hanging out with their friends, you know, shooting the shit and then going back to their hovel yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and and painting stuff or, <laughs> you know, or writing or whatever, whatever they did. Yeah. You know, 
that was a great you know subculture and it's all it's pretty much all gone now why is it because of like gentrification and all that kind of shit is it well yeah you know i mean the price of everything went up real estate values went through the roof one of the problems is is that when you have an artist community in an urban center mm. that's like the cool place to be so when you have that uh all of a sudden everyone wants to be there too because that's that's like the cool place where all the hipsters want to go and you know yeah. obviously a lot of rich people want to be hip so <laughs> they'll spend money to be there around the same time that was happening is when donald trump sort of got his right his he, he started on his rise and he you know i mean the economy changed at the same time you know we had a republican president who kind of made kind of started deregulating banks and things like that so a lot of people were you know who are at the upper echelons were able to profit more right. trump is busy kind of redesigning new york and uh all of a sudden rich people are interested in buying art and slumming, you know, going downtown and hanging out with the artists. And all of a sudden they're like, wow, I'd like to live in a loft too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I'd like to hang out. I'd like to, you know, slum with the cool people. So I think I'm going to buy that loft. And all of a sudden like people started buying these huge chunks of property. And back then some of these lofts were like, you know, you could find a place for like five, 10,000 square feet, you know, in downtown. Yeah. Uh, there, I mean, huge places, you know, just for like, you know, one or two people to live. You know, you're dealing with like a this cavernous place yeah. that you could buy for almost nothing. And of course, like that real wow. estate, some of the most expensive real estate in the world now. But back then it was like, you know, if you were an artist, you could find a really, really big loft. And they were all zoned. They're all artists owned. Like there were oh. special, there you know you had to qualify with the city, and you could rent a place that was gargantuan, you know where you obviously had to put in like uh, plumbing and things like that. Yeah, you could rent it for a couple hundred bucks a month because you were an artist. Wow. Like, people weren't trying to jack your rent. I visited a friend who lived in a uh, kind of like a railroad type loft cool. that literally spanned from east 11th to east 12th street like it was it ran the entire length of the block from 11th Whoa. to 12th and there are two families living in this loft and i swear to god like there weren't doors on any of the rooms <laughs> these people never saw each other that's crazy they never saw each other like there were separate rooms in a railroad style flat cool but, and it with no doors but you could you were so far away from each other you couldn't even hear each other the wow. ceilings must have been like 12, 15 feet high or something like that. It was massive. Shit. And the guy was paying like 300 bucks a month. <laughs> That's crazy. From 1979, 80. Shit. Yeah, 1980. That must have been exciting though. Like, because you know, like when cities are vibrant, they really inform. I always think weather and places inform how you write music. You know, it kind of has a big totally. aspect on your, your kind of, we're writing all sad songs in Ireland because it's raining all the time. <laughs> you know, it's like that kind of vibe. And I think a vibe, it's hard for kind of a lot of young bands to get those kind of vibes back because you can't really get those places. There's no there's no young artist going to afford somewhere like that anymore. Well, you, you can't. Um, I mean, the global economic situation makes it difficult to be an artist to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if there were like communities that welcomed artists and kind of like created an umbrella for them to live with. And, but it's just, it's not something that I think that people would want to take a chance on. It's not like you would need someone, a, phil a philanthropist that like, you know, of like epic proportions to do something like that. Yeah. You know? Um, and, but you also don't have very many people who are, uh, who are, who are really kind of, I guess, examples like good, like good exemplars for, for you, for young artists to follow. So ultimately mm -hmm. the best you've got is to go back and listen to some old records and see if there's anything that kind of jives with you, yeah. but you don't really have like the reference. You don't have the lineage kind of broke off a while ago and um, you don't get this sense of continuity anymore. So there are guys like Jimmy Page who are still alive, but like, 
I mean, they've basically told you all they need, all you need to know about them. Like I've seen in interviews where Paige said that with Led Zeppelin, they essentially created sort of like an encyclopedia of, you know, of how to, of how to do that particular type of rock music. So I think he left all the bird crumbs that he needed to, <laughs> yeah. but because the business isn't really acclimated anymore to promoting artistry, it's actually very difficult for an artist, someone who is artistically inclined to, to actually follow that road. Mm. So you don't have the same kind of impetus to do it and you don't, you're not motivated the same way. And you also don't get all the outward um, I guess, tells or, you know, signifiers, you know, about this is how you do it. You know, as an artist, you're going to be um, marginalized by people. Like nowadays to be an artist, you have to be someone who becomes an entertainer or a performer, yeah. you know, because that's how you become acceptable doing art. Yes. If you can call it art at this point, because it really isn't because people aren't really using it to express anything or to communicate anything. Yeah. You and know, plus, and plus so everyone, it's a whole different thing. Plus everyone knows, everyone knows everything about everyone. Like that's what I used to love about Bowie. Like you didn't know where David Jones ended and David Bowie began. Like there was a kind of enigma, kind of enigma, sorry. Yeah. Enigma. Quality. And now everyone knows everything about everyone. They know what they're, do and they know what you know it's the mystery i always like that about the mystery of you know kind of like the beach boy smile all, all that kind of stuff and there's none of that kind of vibe or mystery anymore and it's kind of sad no there 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 really isn't you know uh to be an artist now certainly to be one where you kind of strike off on your own path and really follow Mm -hmm. what it is that's in your heart rather than kind of following a formula or direction that someone else has laid out for you is it's it's close to impossible at this point you know they're just there's just it's there's there's just no way to kind of get the, the the right kind of support i mean that's one reason why i've stopped producing records and i work more with uh helping artists on a more i guess formative level right you know working helping them work with songs and just kind of getting a better sense of direction like who they are what they really want to do because there's nothing like that at all i mean back in the old days we used to have artist development in record companies and you know it's almost like a school guidance counselor <laughs> yeah. you know sort of helping you figure out what path you're going to take in life yeah and you know, they just don't do that. I mean, the path is very simple. It's like either you're going to make something, either you're going to make something that sounds familiar and that can possibly make money, or you're not going to be doing anything. Mm -hmm. Certainly not anything that anyone else is going to like. I mean, you can wind up on Bandcamp, for example, and do it that way, which, you know, I mean, most of the music I listen to now is off Bandcamp, <laughs> you know, because frankly, even though, it's all kind of like based around specific genres. At least it's a little more compelling. Yeah. <laughs> Some of it, you know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, at least that's that's what I'm finding. Um, do, do you listen you to know, a lot of new music? Um, not popular music, no. I mean, I, every time I listen to anything that's new and popular, I just kind of go... <laughs> It doesn't do a whole lot for me. Like there's some really talented people out there. Yeah. Like someone just turned me on to an artist named Labyrinth, who I probably should have known for a long time. Oh, he's a cool dude. He's a good producer. He's ridiculous. He's incredibly talented. You know, there's yeah. lots of people like that out there who are doing all kinds of great things, mm. you know, and I have to be honest with you. I listen to it and I go, this is wonderful. I'm not going to sit around. I'm not going to choose to listen to this. And it's not because of the style of music. It's just sort of like, I'm not getting this. I, I'm looking for something very specific when I listen to music. It's not stylistic. It's not genre. It's not, none of that. There's mm. kind of like a, there's an essential kind of emotional sort of rawness, like a connectivity, a resonance that I'm looking for when I listen to music. And if it's not there, I'm like, yeah, I can acknowledge the technical aspects of it, the things that are great, but it just doesn't have me. Mm -hmm. And it's one reason I think why people don't spend 
as much money as they did, uh, you know, actually investing in physical music. Obviously, they don't have to anymore because you've got direct access via streaming. So really, the 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 motivation to have to go out and buy a record now is pretty much non-existent. Yeah. yeah. You know, but with that said, people still do buy some records, you know, yeah. uh, and it's interesting how the connection to that sort of thing has fallen by the wayside. Yeah, yeah. Because you when, you when you buy a record, there's like, I don't know what it was like when you were younger, but when I was younger, <laughs> you know, I'd buy a record and some of the songs were like, oh, I'm not really mad about that, but I couldn't afford to buy 10 records, so I'd keep listening to that. And then the song I kind of wasn't too mad about would mostly, no, not all the time, but be like, oh my God, that's my favorite song now. Whereas nowadays, yeah. it's like McDonald's and everything's a playlist and... You know, I like an album as a piece of art and I find that's kind of missing. And I think when that becomes missing, then people have no, it, it devalues music in a lot of ways. If it's just like, ah, it's a song here and a song there. Yeah, pretty much. I definitely, I, I feel the same way. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a transition, whether it's sad or not, it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think it might be sad from the standpoint of you and I, like, we feel like something's being lost. And I mean, in a way, yeah, I guess you could say that. Yeah. There's definitely a transition going on. Uh, you know, uh, it's hard to say whether it's a positive transition, but it's definitely, it's definitely a massive transition, but it does seem uh, by just witnessing the transition that the value of music from a cultural and a personal standpoint in people's lives has changed drastically yeah. from the time that you and I would have been young till, till now, uh, because music definitely meant something. It meant something more to me. Like now it's become part of a fashion statement or something that you have, that you can do have running in the background to kind of just occupy your mind while you're doing something else that may be a little bit more in the forefront. And you know, that, that was not, that was never my uh, relationship to music. You know, that it was definitely in the forefront when it was there and it was something that was very engaging. And it was also something that made you experience something, feel something very deeply. Oftentimes something that you can repeat somatically every time you listen to it again. And, uh, or it would be playing at a certain point in your life that was memorable and it would sort of help cement that memory forever in you. So you could, you could have a, a visual memory of what happened and you'd also have the somatic memory as well, you know? So, uh, the rela that relationship is definitely being lost on a cultural level and on a technological level too, uh, and I do think that there are people who are much younger than you or I are who are very, I think they're kind of conscious of the fact that that's being lost and are not happy about it and are really trying to kind of regain some sort of uh, connection to it by any means possible, which is one reason why they go back to older recordings. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked as to how many people who are much younger than you know, who, who are considerably younger than I am seem to still be interested in music that I've worked on, which is really, you know, it's, I, I'm honored, obviously. But, uh, you know, it's good to know that there are people out there who want to have that connection. Because I think when you lose that, you lose an essential part of your humanity, or at least what makes you part of, you know, the human family, like, like just a, a thinking, feeling, emotional human being, one who can have empathy towards others because art really kind of informs us how to have that type of connection. Yeah, for sure. I Speaking of being young, I remember <laughs> when I was, it was just around the time Untouchables, before Untouchables came out and someone came in school, they were like, man, you got to hear this, this song here <laughs> to stay. This guy named Michael Beinhorn produced it. You got to hear it. I remember hearing that for the first time and I was like, holy shit, man, that just blew my... It was so heavy, but heavy in like a different way. Not like, I don't know how to describe it. 
you know, like those new metal records at the time. It was heavy, yeah. but it was it's it wasn't like that. It was like its own heaviness. That was that was my opinion yeah. of it. It was just so it was like a wall of sound, but it was oh man, that record sounds incredible, <laughs> like incredible, man. How Thank did you. how well, did you I'm, how I'm did happy you, that you, sorry how did you get the drum sound so gonna, big? Um, well, first I was going to say I'm happy that you identified that it stood apart from all the other records of that For that sure. genre in that period because that was really consciously done. Like okay. That was something that I really, really made a tremendous effort to do. I mean, I, the thing is, is that from my perspective, it was never too hard to do something like that because I already knew how most people cut drums and cut, okay. you know, c- cut records like that. It's yeah. like you just put up a bunch of mics and you record it. You know, my approach was always specifically about trying to get a sound for each instrument that would really reflect who the performer was and that would be that it would happen in a way that was in such bold contrast to anything else that anyone else had heard and also i'd like to draw influences in from other places places where you wouldn't expect like i wasn't listening to other new metal records right because frankly i didn't think most of them sounded very good (laughs) you know my interest was more in like electronic music you know, so I felt that things like that had more relevance. I always liked the presence of samples on records and synthesizers. And I just felt that when people recorded guitars, you know, I mean, it was always the same thing. Like put a 57 up on a Marshall cab and you got the sound. Like, yeah, sure. I mean, that sounds good, but it doesn't sound as good as if you put up a couple of cabinets. You know, you spend time deciding which cabinets you're going to use, which amp heads you're going to use, which cables you know, mix and match, see what sounds better. And then select a different cabinet, see which speaker on each cabinet sounds good. Then pick the microphones, which mics are you going to use? And so on and so on. And really spend a lot of time getting a sound that not only sounds amazing, but also reflects the spirit of the artist who's going to be performing that that sound. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why those drums had to be over the top. Like they just had to be bone crunching. What's cool is it looks like we're going to do a 20th anniversary oh, wow. release of that. Um, so we're talking, we're getting ready, I think, to do an immersive um, mix of Untouchables. Cool. Uh, and and um, I think that we're going to be re-releasing, that we're going to be um, releasing a whole bunch of roughs um, that I did while the record was in pro was in uh, progress sweet and those roughs are it, it, every time i listen like my feeling about the drums was i wanted to feel like i mean i'm not a masochist but i wanted to feel like i was getting punched in the side of the <laughs> that's head that's exactly the feeling when i hear that so i was like i want to punch something <laughs> you have that feeling like it's just got that like yeah. oh. well that was you know that was it it had to kind of give you an immediate visceral reaction because that's you know, again, that goes back to my what we were talking about earlier. When I listened to music when I was young, I got a jolt from it. I mm. got some kind of reaction to it. It wasn't always happy, but it was a reaction. And it was it, it was relative to the music I was listening to. So I wanted to make sure on that record, you know, anything else that I worked on, that, that it had that kind of re- reaction for people, that it would resonate with them. And if I could feel it in the studio while I was working on it, I was absolutely confident that someone else listening to the record would feel it too. You know, yeah. but those are things that you have to work hard to get. Like it's not easy just to kind of pull that out. I mean, you could do it with Muddy Waters and bands like the Rolling Stones, you know, because the Stones had a sound and they knew how to play their instruments. They knew when they you know, when Charlie Watts hit his drum a certain way, it was going to sound like Charlie Watts. It didn't matter at that point which mics you put up on his drum kit. Yeah, Muddy Waters could sit and could write a song in like 15, 20 minutes, sit down and record it, and that would be it. And you've got a piece of history right there. You know, but people can't make records like that anymore. So my experience was you had to work hard to be able to create something and it, and it went beyond writing great songs. I, I find a lot of people go, ah, no one's buying your record to hear a great snare drum sound. It's like, bullshit. You know, like, like 
I get the whole, it's got, it's, the songs have to be there first. That's absolutely true. The foundation has to be laid and the songs have to be great. But if you have great, a great foundation and you record it badly, you're basically shitting on your product at that point. You're basically taking away a whole level, a whole layer of engagement, potential engagement with an audience yeah. that, that they deserve to hear. And that's why I don't buy this whole no one, you know, no one bought your record to listen to your snare drum sound argument. It's nonsense. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's like someone's good looking. If they're wearing the clothes that don't suit them, they look like an asshole. So you need to find <laughs> something. You know, it's like production and you're painting it. You know, when you're doing production, and so you you need it's always finding the right colors and everything. And I think I totally agree with you. I think like that that record you did with Mew, Mew and the Glass Hand of Kites. That production and everything, I love that record. That perfectly goes hand in hand with their music and what they were trying to achieve. I I I think. That record, w I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass, but that record without your production style would be completely a different record and it would be the, it just, just sometimes, you know, these things are just gel perfectly together and I think that, I, I love yeah. that sound of that record. Like, I love that sound. Of, like, everything you did in that record, I thought, incredible. So, yeah, I agree Thank with you. What I love it. I love it too. Are you a fan of that record, yeah? I am, yeah. I yeah. think it's a great record. I do yeah, too. I'm I really too. proud of it. They're a great band. I'd say Bo was quite difficult at heart. <laughs> I've seen videos with him. He looks very kind of combative, but probably in a good way. He was. He was very combative. Um, I think the rest of the band were um, were kind of afraid of him. <laughs> they didn't want to. They didn't want to have. Uh, they didn't want to have any run-ins with him because he he was always the guy who who take things up the extra step that no one wanted to go. Okay. Uh, by the same token. Bo was one of the things that made the band great. I mean, he yeah. is a very, he, he is and was a very unique guitarist. Uh, he, he had some great ideas. I mean, he really, he did some wonderful things. And I mean, I think that he counterbalanced what Jonas brings to the band, excuse me, in a really great way. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's one reason why I'm, I'm, I'm sad that he's not with them anymore. Yeah, uh, you know, because he really he he brought something really great to the mix. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, yeah, he it's it's weird. They're a good band. I still like Mew. I think they're cool. But the records yeah. after him, they they they're kind of they're just missing something. They you can feel it when well, you can hear it. I I think anyways, because his guitar, like you were saying, is so unique. He had that really nice kind of it was like a shredded, cleany kind of sound. Yeah, yeah, and he had a very kind of very spiky angular kind of like jarring way of, of doing things. And it was such a great contrast against the smoothness of like some of the keyboard sounds and Jonas's voice. I mean, it, it's, it made it so unusual. Like everything was so strange. And I mean, you've got a great rhythm section. Silas is an excellent drummer and Johan who is such a great bassist. Like he just, he suited the band perfectly. And it's, it was just, it, it, I'm glad that I was able to work with them on Glass Handed Kites. It was really, it, it, it was a great experience and I'm so proud of that record. Yeah, they're a great band though. Amazing band. What, yeah. What, what was it, uh, you got, you, what was it like working with Herbie Hancock? Like, that must have been just incredible. <laughs> um, it was, uh, it was interesting, you know, I mean, we kind of built the track up from scratch uh, without Herbie being involved in that part of it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm in the process of finishing a book about that whole, about making that and uh, a couple of things that uh, happened in the, uh, in the eighties, like working in my first band material and mm -hmm. creating the fresh scratch, which became the most sampled sound in the history of recorded music. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. And uh, it is crazy. And and culminating in working on Herbie's record and doing Rocket with him. Uh, but uh, it was it, it was kind of surreal, actually. I mean, because I was like 20, 22 when we started working with Herbie. Wow. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was working with this other guy, Bill Laswell, and we'd been 
making, I guess, obscure, weird, sort of <laughs> abstract type records for a little while. And then we started making stuff that was a little more jazzy. And then we started matriculating over to more R&B stuff, which wound us up doing some st work with Whitney Houston. And we did a record with a singer called Nona Hendrix. And then Herbie contacts us to do two songs for what was, what was going to be his last solo record for Columbia. And uh, it was really an out of the blue type thing. Right. And we were very up for the challenge you know so we created these uh we created these two tracks for him i mean i'd never worked with a keyboard player before i mean i i'd, I'd worked with some pretty amazing keyboardists at that time but his technical facility was just ridiculous <laughs> i mean he's you know he's he's herbie hancock <laughs> yeah <man. laughs> you know but i got to program all the synthesizers so that's pretty badass. made it fun for me. That's yeah. badass. Yeah, we like... I was happy. He didn't want to do any of that. He didn't want to do any of the heavy lifting there. Uh, okay, so you got to do the fun stuff, all that programming. <laughs> I got to do the fun stuff. Yeah, we do it. We do nothing on the synclavier. Uh, he didn't have a synclavier at his studio. Oh, we worked with him. Um, he only he had a Fairlight. Um, oh, Fairlight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking of. Which I was very, I was absolutely like. It was one of those things that like only really rich people could have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was just, I was just drooling over it. <laughs> but I was drooling over a lot of things that he had. <laughs> he had like a, an old Sennheiser VSM two hundred one vocoder, wow. which is probably the, that's like the, best the the best vocoder ever made. That's the one that Kraftwerk used on all their records. Sweet. And, yeah, I saw that. And I was like. <laughs> oh my god because <laughs> those things are rarer than hen's teeth and you know i mean it's like a hundred thousand dollar vocoder or something like that just amazing wow uh but yeah it was a lot of fun it was just kind of like a no holds barred like full-on like how far can your imagination take you type experience it was, it was great was there was there like because it was his last record was it was there was it kind of a bit less pressure than if they were trying to have some hit or something like that Oh God. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, it was kind of like a, you know, you got nothing left to lose type moment. Right. You know, you've played pretty much your full hand. Although I think we were brought on board by Herbie's um, at that time assistant who became his manager because he felt that even though uh, Herbie was about to get the boot that he really did have some good cards to play. And if he worked with people who kind of thought a little bit outside the box that he might actually be able to do something, mm. you know, it would set him up in some way. Of course, none of us realized, excuse me, just how much the song would actually set him up or the record would set him up. I mean, it basically changed the entire trajectory of his career. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really was. He's playing here in August. So I've never seen him before, so I'm looking forward to seeing him live. I've never seen him live, so I'd say that's going to be... I, I hope you have a good time. Oh, I'll try. <laughs> it's Herbie Hancock. You can't go wrong, can you? <laughs> when you were do, doing more production work, were you just still doing everything analog or were you veering into plugins or any of that kind of area? Was it purely analog you were still working in? Um, which period are we talking about? Just towards about? the end of your kind of more producing records on a larger, on a more regular basis. Uh, I say that I've been working pretty much consistently digitally since uh, 2002, mm -hmm. but under protest mainly um <laughs> except on the except on the corn record where it was my choice um and it was my choice because we wanted i wanted to record the record in a high-res digital format which had never been done on a metal record before oh, wow. pretty much any like loud heavy kind of rock record everyone was still at 44 one maybe 48 mm. and i want to go 96 24 
So we got a hold of this really <laughs> high end um, digital, like a dedicated recording system. It wasn't a DAW, it was an actual digital recorder called the Euphonics R1. Ooh. And we recorded into that. And I mean, at the time, you just really you, you couldn't get much better in terms of quality if you wanted to record a large scale multi track um digital recording yeah uh so that you know on that project we were we stayed in digital we ed did all our editing in nuendo which was pretty new at the time and uh unfortunately steinberg who owned nuendo at that point were adamant about making a high-res uh digital recorder that had no way to be able to get like a high res input. So you could only use a MIDI time code reader. Oh my God. To get, to get into it, which is, uh, I mean, even now it kind of hinders my ability to be able to <laughs> adequately express just how stupid a choice that was. They had no AES input on this thing at all. And <clears throat> every day it seemed like my engineer, my friend, Frank Filippetti, who was recording the project was on the phone to Steinberg screaming at them at the top of his lungs, <laughs> going like, how stupid can you people be? You know, you're the only high-res DAW in the world. You have the inside track. You know, you've got every major, like, producer engineer who's got a name associated with quality recording backing yeah. your product. Yeah. And you refuse to, to make an AES um, interface so that we can actually go straight in with mic pre's and consoles and things like that. It's all MIDI time code. Like, have you seriously taken leave of your senses? <laughs> and they're like, oh, you know, you know, you know, why would we want to do something like that? They figured that they had this 96 K 24 bit recorder that they wanted to market to like bedroom producers. Okay. We're kind of like, Wait, you've got now Schmidt endorsing your product and you want some guy who's like doing, who's recording like soft synths in his bedroom to like, what the hell is wrong with you? So in the meantime, while they're just sitting on their hands doing nothing, Pro Tools has enough time to come out with their 96, 24 bit system and then just blow straight past Steinberg. Wow. You know? Yeah. So obviously everyone's using Pro, Pro Tools now and you know, there's only a handful of people in the world using new end though, but they could have been, yeah. And they had plenty of pressure about it as well, but you know, um, I don't like working with, with computers, um, and recording. Mm -hmm. I just don't, <laughs> I don't like the interface. I never will. Um, I like tape, I like tape machines. Um, but they don't always sound right for a project. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't like DAWs to record into, but sometimes you don't have a choice, which is another reason why I'm not really interested in recording stuff anymore, because I don't like being told you don't have a choice to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and you have too much choice with a DAW. Like that's the thing you can, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're not able to, I think it's like Netflix, you know, you've, t I go on Netflix and uh, I have so much choice to watch fucking nothing. I just go, I was like, what have I done? I've watched nothing. And I think as so, human beings, when we're given a small, if you're given three choices, three movies, you'll watch one. Yeah. It's an interesting point, though, because in the world of too many choices, you're still, you're, you still butt up against limitations. With Netflix, <laughs> the limitation is you come to a point where you realize that actually most of their programming is garbage. <laughs> yeah. That's the reality. That's the reality. And then you come to the the understanding of this is why I didn't want to watch any movies on there because most of the movies on there are movies I don't want to watch anyway. Like I wouldn't have chosen this. And the movies that I have been watching are movies that I've watched because I didn't really feel like I had any other choices. Yeah. This is another reason why Netflix has actually lost a third of its valuation over the past two or three weeks. Like they had a massive drop in their share price, you know, same thing is true with DAWs. When you're dealing with Pro Tools, you're dealing with the sound of Pro Tools. Ultimately, no matter, the, regardless of the fact that you could do like a 300 track session and put like every kind of plugin known to man on it, mm -hmm. you still face the reality that you're dealing with the sound of Pro Tools. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, 
there are tremendous limitations to that sound. Tape is different because on a tape recorder, you might you can get up to 24 tracks. You know, you can screw with it a whole bunch of different ways that don't involve that don't involve plugins that really just involve what your signal chain looks like. Yeah. And how hard you want to hit the tape, what your over bias and biasing is on the tape, you know, what speed you're running at. And within that narrow range, you've got like a universe of choices. So it winds up being it winds up being completely different. Pro Tools, you're really stuck in a world where everything sounds like Pro Tools. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I'm depressed. You now. know. <laughs> Why? Well, you I know. To, I, I mean, you I, still have three hundred tracks. Oh god, that's that's too many. That's too many. <laughs> and all the plugins. That's and all many. the plugins. So it's different. You know, it's different types of stuff. I mean, you can tune a vocal. You can do stuff. Ew. You know, you can move. You can shift a note inside of a chord. Excuse me, where someone was playing out of tune, where someone was kind of like pulling on a note too hard. You know, I've done records where we've tuned vocals, but my idea of tuning vocals and someone else's idea of tuning vocals are two completely different things. Right. You know, um, and there's practical applications in digital as well. Mm -hmm. Like one of the practical applications is that you can adjust absolute, you can adjust phase on every single microphone in a drum setup in a way that you, I mean, if you're on an analog console, you've got a phase flip button. You mm -hmm. might be able to put a phase flip in the, you know, in your signal path in a microphone relative to a different mic. Of course, that's going to screw your sound up, but you know, you, you deal with what you'd rather have, you know, yeah. you want an out of phase microphone, or do you want to have a, you know, drum sound that might've sounded a little better if you didn't have to stick a phase corrector in, in the path. Yeah. You know, but in pro t in, in, in a DAW, you can obviously go into your tracks. You can apply, these like these plugins that will phase align every single drum mic, you know, to a hit where you can, you can phase align it down to like samples and stuff like that. And all of a sudden things sound completely different than you've ever heard them sounding before because all your drum tracks are like, boom, phase lock. Yeah. You know, which is not what happened when you recorded them because everything yeah. happened at different intervals of time, yeah. you know, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, being able to do that level of correction. Yeah, I mean, you can do that in a way that you can't possibly do with analog equipment. So that's great. But, you know, you've got the, you, you still have the sound of the digital recording. I mean, obviously, you have the speed and transient response of digital, which is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, there's so many different elements that make that up. I mean, Talking about digital recording is a whole different topic, <laughs> and it's it it would it, it would require its own conversation because I've got my own views on it, and it's one of the reasons that I'm not very fond of. It. <laughs> so well, I'm, I'm convinced I'm convinced that most people don't understand the true nature of it. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Well, for me. I, I I kind of um I would love to have grown up in that era of recording tape. Like I've never recorded on tape, so I don't know. So I I'm pro I'm missing out on so much, and I feel that like my generation of like people who do music or record it and like that, you know, we've just we're so used to oh, fix it in the mix and fix it in the mix, and ah, oh, you know, it's to, it's to get past that, you know. Like I hear a record like Spirit of Eden by Talk Talk. Have you ever heard that record? Oh yeah. Oh, incredible man. Like that is just you know, like they didn't yeah. they didn't really mix anything on that. They just it was recorded and they put a bit of EM EM what EMT tape or whatever you call it. And that was it. I was like, jeez. EMT two fifty, the that, reverb? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I think that's all they put up on that record. I'm pretty sure. And it's just a bit of like compression when they're recording. Like it's just genius stuff. That's the way we used to do it in the old days, you know. I mean it was all about trying to get things great when yeah. you got the tape. Yeah, you know, or whatever your storage medium was, you know, um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's unfortunately this is these are all pressures that have been that have been brought to bear on artists who are attempting mm -hmm. to make recordings and stuff, and by artists I mean all of us who are involved in the production process as well, 
because we can't really take the time to do what we would really like to do and enjoy, have the, the wonderful experience of searching for sounds and, you know, and, and trying to kind of trying to maximize our equipment to the fullest mm -hmm. to, uh, excuse me, to get something that we're actually proud of, or we can sit there and go, wow, this actually sounds really good. You know, people don't have the ability to do that anymore. It's, it's, the process of making a record has become more functional than anything else. And that's really sad because that's really not my experience mm -hmm. of it at all. My experience is something completely different. And uh, I, I like that experience a great deal. I always, I always did. And the idea of feeling rushed or feeling like you're in the pro your process of trying to do what you do for an artist is actually being hurried along because mm -hmm. it's more in the interest, it's more in the artist's interest to get their record done on time and on budget and not spend a whole lot of money doing it instead of make a document that's going to stand the test of time forever. Yeah. That's kind of, it's, it's sort of, it's not sort of, it's utterly self-defeating. Yeah, you know, sure. so at this point I'm, I'm more like, well, if I, if that's, if, if that's what I have to face down, I would just as soon not do it and focus on something different. Yeah. Are, are there, um, are there mu music, are there albums that you listen to, whether it's production or whatever, that you kind of, I wouldn't say grow up with, but just albums in general that you listen to that just blew your mind from a production point of view? Um, yeah, there are plenty. I mean, from the time I was young, obviously, I was listening to stuff like The Beatles. You know, Quality. and the production on, I mean, I didn't even know what production was when I was first listening to the Beatles, but the way the record sounded, they had it, they all had a vibe to them. Mm -hmm. They had something going on, something that painted a picture in your mind. And you didn't even know what that picture was. You couldn't really explain what it was. It was just something that was there. It was, you know, a, a mental aspect that I would associate with a visual experience. Um, that accompanied my sensory experience of a piece of music. And that was really profound. And yeah, I mean, that a lot of that had to do with how those records sounded. Mm -hmm. You know, not knowing what it was I was listening to, not knowing what the instruments were that produced these sounds, how they were made, what the various processes were that went into creating them, who was involved with the band, <laughs> getting all that work done and how meticulously they worked, you know, trying to, trying to create these things that there actually was a lot of thought that went into making those things, Yeah, you know, and doing things differently. Like on some songs, having the band change instruments and having like the guitarist play the bass and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, all that amounted to something for me as a, as a young listener, before I knew what music production actually was, that made it a mysterious, magical, mystical experience. You did know, you, did you always and, want to be a producer? Was it was there a point where you're like, oh, this is what I want to do? Was it just was uh, something you kind of well, always? When I started doing it was when I figured, you know, I, I did it once and then I did it a couple <laughs> more times and I was like, I guess this is what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to you know, find out. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I had to come to terms with the fact that I never really wanted to be a musician or be in a band. You know, it was just not right. my thing. Right. Uh, and I have at this point no interest in being a musician whatsoever. I mean, I love electronic music, but uh, I'm just... It's just not anything that 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 is that that's an interesting to me. Yeah. People who are who are capable of expressing themselves through musical instruments, that's an amazing thing. I love that, and I like being part of the process of helping people like that get to get further along in what they do. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to go and sit at the piano and start like playing. That's definitely not for me. <laughs> you can you can you can play a piano though, can't you? I'm not very well. Being a producer like you are, it, it, it's it's so entwined with great with the uh, with great albums. Like the production work, I think a lot of people who just listen to music uh, like that great album, they go, "Oh, it's a great album." But the production is such an important 
key of that album. Like, you know, you did Mother's Milk. That is an important key of that album, you know. And I, I was listening to you in an interview and you were saying how <laughs> you kind of kicked Anthony out of the band and then uh, he kind of was happy when he came back in. And I suppose, like, being a producer like that, you're like a babysitter as well, aren't you? Can you have to take on all these roles. It must be, like, stressful. Rewarding, but stressful, I'm sure. Uh, it's unbelievably stressful, you know, um, but it's only stressful in as much as the people that you're working with are in particularly different places, difficult places in their lives. Mm -hmm. Working with the Chili Peppers was a very unusual experience because at that point in their careers, no one outside of Los Angeles really cared about them. Mm -hmm. And even in Los Angeles, there weren't that many people. They had a very, very small group of fans and uh, their record company didn't like them. And they had, there was just immense amounts of strife that was going on within the band. Obviously the drug, yeah, the drug use is probably the worst of it, but having to deal with all that stuff and also being like a 26 year old kid. I mean, I'd never produced a record on my own like this before for an American band. Yeah, this is my first American solo production, and I truly got dropped in at the deep end of the pool. You know, having to make a record with a band who no one else wanted to work with, whose record company despised them, and had two heroin addicts. Fun times. <laughs> That's a mild way of putting it. Yeah, <laughs> hard times maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes for good stories. Yeah. For sure, for sure. How and how, how, what's the difference how, from a kind of um, what you get out of a difference? You, you know, you know, you get you're getting something out of producing something. What's the difference when you're writing a book? How, how does how does what do you get out of that as well? I know you're getting something obviously because you like doing it, but how do you... writing a book as far as you mean a book about the work that I've done mm -hmm, mm, or the current book you're working on? Um, well, I'm actually working on several. It's a series of uh, all these different records that I've done. Oh, sweet. Uh, yeah, I, I should be doing one on Untouchables as well. In fact, I'm partway through that. Wow, that's um, cool. Well, this is basically, pur it, it's purgative. Like I, I'm basically purging a whole bunch of stuff in me mm -hmm. that it's time to kind of, it's time to release. I mean, these it's funny because people have been asking me to write books about projects I've worked on for years. And I've just been like, no, I mean, cause I know that if I do this, most of the people that I've worked with will never want to talk to me again. <laughs> <laughs> not that I've, you know, not, not that I speak with most of these people on a regular basis, but there's yeah. a lot of stuff in, in these, you know, in, in those experiences that really kind of illustrate the, the reality of making a record at that level mm -hmm. uh, and the difficulties and the personalities involved. And it really, and they really demonstrate that the process of making, of producing a record has become this thing where people are very, they paint it as this kind of glamorous kind of existence in rarefied air where you're sort of like, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of, you, you occupy this sort of lofty position with the artists and everything kind of just sort of flows, you know? And it's like, you know, I, I, there are records that get made like that for sure, but a lot of records don't, and mm -hmm. they can be very, very difficult and very trying. And I think the experience is a valuable one to share with other people, to give them an inside experience of what it's like sort of from a boots on the ground perspective. You know, so it's allowing the, the process of writing these books is really allowing me to kind of free all these experiences and sort of let, let go of them. Yeah. And send them out, send them out into the world. Like, I, I think there's a great value in sharing this stuff with other people. And I'm actually very excited about it. It's fun. It's That's interesting it. reading some of this stuff too and going like, I can't believe that happened. <laughs> <laughs> like, did I actually really go through that? Did that really actually happen? This is crazy. No one would believe this. Wow. You know, 
Is there yeah, stuff? Is there stuff well. that like you've forgotten? That, obviously, and then you've kind of you've you've found it out again, and, le- and you're like, "Holy shit, man!" And I, I totally forgot about that. And then, yeah, yeah. And I actually kind of went back and sort of re- revisited a lot of motivations for why I made certain decisions on projects. Mm-hmm. And I can recollect that in some cases I was pretty conscious about what I was doing. In other cases, I was sort of semi-conscious but made a very rational, logical decision anyway. And it's really fascinating to parse those choices out and to look at them and go, wow, that's really interesting. You know, and to also think about some of the stressors that may have put me in a position where I had to make a decision that was particularly difficult. Yeah, yeah. Like, would that be like firing, not firing a drummer, but, you know, having... You know, you have to have that talk. I know there was that that story about you talking to the the whole drummer, and I remember, it, it, like, it's like everything. You know, these stories they get way blown out of proportion, and then you hear the real truth. Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, I can imagine you've heard things. You're like, that never happened. What the fuck are you talking about? Well, I mean, it's interesting because she actually did a movie about it, or someone did a did oh, a wow. movie about her. Yeah, and I mean, it was it was it was interesting because I was essentially vilified completely. I mean, it's. That's it's kind of uh, it, it's it's very sobering mm-hmm. to see when someone's made a movie like that and they've kind of framed you as being sort of like the a personal victim and v- personal like villain in their lives and the reason for their their own downfall, you know. So I, I mean, I actually had people emailing me like threatening me and stuff. Really? Because from that movie? Oh yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, absolutely. That is such yeah. a human thing, isn't it, though? We always t- tend to, like, even if it's a breakup or something small like that, we always go, oh, well, it was the other person's fault. It was never my fault. We never kind of internally go, well, look, how did I, you know, what happened for it to get to this point? And, yeah, people can be like that. And I'm sure rock stars, they ain't, they ain't taking too much credit for their shitty decisions. Um, It's, I, I, I haven't seen it happen very often. I have seen it, but, you know, it's, in that particular instance, it wasn't a case of of Patty going like of Patty acknowledging why things were happening. It wasn't mm-hmm. as if they just it wasn't as if they just sort of happened out of the ether or there was this like cabal against her from the beginning. Right. You know. But it doesn't change the fact, as you're saying before, that having to go to her and explain where we were at and what we had to do next. You know that it was a that it wasn't a really really difficult thing to have to do. I mean, it was mm-hmm. it was agonizing because you know you're talking to another human being. You know you're break you're basically breaking their heart. Like the one thing I know she did want to do was play on her own record, and it made sense. It's her band. Those are songs that she performed that that she was involved with. She should be playing on the record. You know there needs to be a really really good reason why that's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's, you know, and when you have to put someone on the spot like that, it's not even putting them on the spot, basically dictating to them what they're going to do next. And that the next thing they do is not going to be playing on their record and that someone else is going to be replacing them. I mean, that's devastating, you know, and I, I had to I had to think about that before I actually did it. And I had to live mm. with it. Unfortunately, we were so far along in the process and we'd spent so much time waiting to get drum tracks that I really didn't have a whole lot of time to really kind of, you know, to, to do anything. Like I had to act immediately. Excuse me. Yeah. But yeah, I was, that was extremely difficult and I would not recommend it to anyone else. Did you she, know. did she ever contact you after the movie? Oh, I hadn't spoken to, I, I didn't speak to her since, um, I saw them. I actually saw them after we did the record. They played a show or something like that. And, you know, I mean, her reaction to me was not, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's nothing you wouldn't have expected. She wasn't particularly friendly. Yeah. yeah. You know, at that point, I couldn't necessarily blame her for feeling the way she did. But I mean, as far as the movie goes, I don't really think that she would have had a lot to say to me after dragging me through the mud like that. You know, it's a shitty thing. I was like, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I I understand the motivation. I can't, I was certainly upset when I saw that, but I can't stay mad about it. You know, I mean, I, I know that she was under a tremendous amount of stress Mm -hmm. more than I could possibly comprehend. So, Mm -hmm. you know, 
I would have handled it differently, but I'm not her. What was the guy like who played you? That's always a weird thing seeing someone play you in a movie. Oh, no, no, no. No, this was a documentary. Oh, documentary. Oh, right. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, wasn't no, they like didn't a use a dramatization of anything. This is a documentary. Ah. So my picture was in the movie. I mean, they didn't have any footage of me. Ah. So like they actually showed my picture. <laughs> oh, no. In the movie, yeah, I was kind of like, Jesus. this sweet guy. I wasn't that big. <laughs> it's lovely. I was innocent. looking at myself. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he couldn't hurt a fly, that one. <laughs> I was like, you know, I mean, I was looking at myself in the movie and I was like, if I'd known this was going to happen, would I have made the same choice? And I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, because it wasn't about my ego. It was about doing what was right by the record. Like the artist hired me to do a job. I was doing my job. Mm. I, if I was her, I'd be, I'd be more angry at the band, not you, because you're kind of like the guy who's just putting the word there. It's not like you're the, you know, they're telling you pull the trigger almost. Oh, I made an easy scapegoat. And I, I, I accepted it as well during the project because when it came time to fire her, I'd already had a conversation with them before and they wouldn't do it. You know, in fact, right. one of the, one of the um, prerequisites for doing the record with them was they, they already knew that I had a reputation for letting drummers go, <laughs> which was interesting because I knew so many producers who would just, who, who would just come on a record and say, okay, which one of you is the drummer? And the guy would be like, I am. And he'd be like, okay, you're gone. It, wow. it wouldn't even be a conversation. You know, so I was like, how do I, how did it that I have a reputation for firing people when there are guys I know who won't even let the drummer play on the record? <laughs> you know, so yeah. I couldn't, I was told I, you're not permitted to fire her. So, you know, I worked with her very, for a very long time before to make, to ensure that she wouldn't be fireable, you know? Right, yeah. And yeah. then when she got in the studio, she just fell apart. So I talked to the band about it and they were like, remember what we said at the beginning of the project? You can't do it. So um, I knew that Courtney was going to be coming back in the studio at some point. And when she came in, I made sure that one of Patty's worst recordings was playing on, you know, was, was, was being played when right. she was there, which was kind of like, I, I, I'm not going to say that was a completely above board thing to do, but it was <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm going to do everything I can at this point to show, to show the artists what they're dealing with. Like this is, basically the, this is the foundation for your record here. Mm -hmm. Like if you, you know, if you want to move forward with that, fine. But based on what those guys told me, it didn't seem like that was the kind of record they wanted to make. And she came in, she heard that and she was like, Oh my God, what is that? I was like, that's your drummer. And she just said, fire, her. you know, and then I had another meeting with the band and they were like, well, you got to do it. So I was the guy, as you're saying, who got shoulder with the task. And I, I said, okay, because I recognized that if they had to do it, mm -hmm. which they wouldn't have done it anyway, um, because they didn't want to make waves, but if they'd had to do it, it would have it um, it would have devastated all their relationships. Like right. it would have, you know, they they had to there had to be something where there was still some kind of, I guess, even keel, like some place where people felt like they're they're okay. So it had I had to look like the villain. In that right. case, and I was like, "Well, I'm not in the band, so it makes it easier for everyone if I just do it." You know, so I I took on on the responsibility of doing it. Yeah. And as I said, I would have done it again under the same under the same circumstances. Yeah. Well, you know, the people tend to kind of like we're saying they, they, you know, there's there's oh, they don't they they only look at their own truth sometimes. They don't look at you know that they understand, don't understand it. Like, that was hard for you to do that as well. They just think, oh, well, me, I know it's hard on her, but, you know, it's not like it's, it's, uh, it's, an, it's not like an easy thing for you to go, oh, hey, you know. But. It didn't, it, but the thing is, it didn't have to be her job to worry about how I felt firing her. Mm. You know, it would never, as far as I'm concerned, it'll never have to be her job. She doesn't have to worry about that. Mm. You know, how she feels about me is her business. I'm not really concerned about that. I did what I did. I did what I had to do. She did what she felt she had to do. And that's where it is. You know? Yeah. The record was the record was done the way it should have been done. The tracks came out great. The record did extremely well. 
everyone got paid no one's complaining <laughs> i'm happy you know and people still love the record so i think it all worked out okay yeah it's a cool sounding record man like it's a good Thank it's you. a it's a badass sounding record uh to tell you i'm very i'm very proud of that one well yeah all, well like come on all your records sound good super super unknown man that's just fucking class man it could go on forever but your books so okay. you doing so your books are you doing it on specific albums that you're you're working yeah. on or is it just just yeah oh yeah so what are the yeah. if you if you can say what are the specific ones well, the first three that I've gotten done are uh, Mother's Milk, mm -hmm. uh, the one about Rocket, cool. and and the the last one of that series is Super Unknown. And oh, cool. I've done one about the Uplift Mofo Party Plan, and I'm working on uh, Mechanical Animals, Celebrity oh, wow. Skin, Untouchables. Wow. Uh, Mew, you got to get. You got to do Mew, man. You got to do the Mew one. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think I can recall enough about making that record. <laughs> well, there's a documentary on a DVD, so watch that. <laughs> a, they, they put out a little documentary somewhere. I think I have it actually, and I remember I've I was, seen it. Yeah, it's I've pretty. Seen it. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I think there was some part. Was maybe a, maybe it was something about the AC, or maybe I'm listening. It was some interview you did, but it was something with the AC, the power at the time, or something. Maybe I'm. Oh, brother. Maybe yeah, I'm. That was, was that. Really, it was yeah? very difficult. Yeah, it was okay because we were down in Venice, and every day around five or six, all the power, like all the, all our amps and our microphones, like the sound of everything would change drastically. And I started to realize that it had to do the, with the fact that that was around the time that everyone was coming home from work and turning <laughs> on their electric, their air, air conditioning, because oh, we were working in the summer at, down at the beach. You know, it was super hot, oh. and. Uh, it would it would like draw down the power grid. Oh right, you grids then. Oh, that would explain it. Shit, man. We had an, and we had a voltage. We had a a power conditioner, but we didn't have a voltage stabilizer. Right. So we had no way to kind of stabilize the electricity. So we were dealing with like, you know. <laughs> so all of a sudden, everything in the studio is kind of like <gasps> must have more air. <laughs> Water. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> More electricity, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we had to work around that. It didn't it it made a lot of our really great guitar sounds suck, frankly. But right. uh, you know, we we did what we could. Yeah, well, definitely definitely uh it, it's a great record. Amazing record. I love Thank that you. record. I love Thank that you. record. Um so before I let you go, because I've taken up a lot of your time, sorry about that. <laughs> but um, don't worry, man. The, but um, so when did the books coming out? Or have you? Are you uh, just kind of going with the flow? Or no, the first one should be out within the next couple of months. Oh, great! Um, they're going to be exclusively through my website. My website will be up, hopefully within an, the next month. I think it's they're all going to be coming together at about the same time. Like Brilliant. I have an old website, which is michaelbeinhorn.com, but this new one's going to be beinhorncreative.com. Excellent. Uh, and yeah, that's basically going to be my matrix, <laughs> so to speak. But yeah, those books will be available through there exclusively. I, re I, I read your first book a few years ago. About cr oh, creativity. awesome. Thank you. That's a great book, man. It's really Thank cool. You. Yeah. I, I, Thanks. I appreciate it. I loved it. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm I'm gonna definitely get those new books for sure. Are they are they long or are they kind of how's that? Uh, right now they're kind of ranging from like 140 to 200 pages, so they're not like big reads or anything like that. But that's cool. The stories in them, I think, are part of what makes them most engaging because again, it's not just about like it's sort of they all cover so much ground, like. You know, I, I I didn't really get into a lot of technical stuff on some of them, mm -hmm. partly because some of them were done such a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And there are things about recording them that I don't really re remember. Yeah. But dealing with the personalities and all the diverse situations that came with came up with uh, on, on both re on, on all these records, like on both Chili Pepper. I mean, you would have thought that by Mother's Milk, with the chili peppers they had their, they had their shit together it's like it was an absolute disaster 
yeah. making that record. It was just pure insanity. The stories are are crazy. I can you know? imagine. And seeing what the different personalities were like, the things that they did, and understanding, like, I think, you know, with so many artists, there's kind of, there's an air of, they're just seen as being apart from the rest of the regular population. You know, they're kind of like, they exist in this sort of mi rarefied mystical air yeah. that none of us are supposed to understand or penetrate. <laughs> but the reality is so much different than that. These are like real people who have real stories. And, you know, even if you read their autobiographies, like with Anthony, for example, like he just kind of like glosses over a lot of stuff. I mean, <laughs> Like I shot up heroin and then I, you know, fucked this girl and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, like, and we did this record kind of thing. And, you know, it's like, it doesn't really, it doesn't tell you anything about who he is or how he did certain things or, you know, or watch his reactions to things that go, that, that happened around him or what his behavior was like when he was a junkie. Like from the, through the eyes of someone who is actually watching it, go, you know, thinking like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you know, sitting down with him and going like, do you want to live or do you want to die? You know, do mm. you, you know, is this the road you really want to go down? Mm. You know, and, you know, and, and also like the climax of all that when we were in the studio and I was like, that's it. Get the fuck out. <laughs> I love, you know, that. I mean, I was like, I was a little kid. I was like 26 years old when I did that. I just, but I just like had it up to my gills with him. And also the way that he, that he was treating the rest of the band, that he was just so disrespectful to the amount of effort that they put into, into working at that point, knowing all the pressures that they were up against, mm -hmm. you sure. know, and trying to basically being in the position of I'm the only person who's going to be able to unravel this because no one else seems to, yeah. you know, those stories are incredibly invaluable because they really paint a true to life picture. I mean, it's highly subjective because it's through the eyes of one person, obviously, but it gives you much more insight into who the artists are, what they were in their creative process. And it's, you know, to me, it's fascinating stuff. No, the truth is no one's ever written books like these before because they're always afraid about pissing people off. <laughs> yeah. hey, if you I don't, don't have that problem. Yeah, don't talk to them anymore. <laughs> no. Do you, is, that, yeah. is that kind of the thing, you know, when you do a record, it's like, that's it. And you don't really talk to those people or is it just, what, what's it that? It depends. I mean, I know a lot of producers who become very chummy with the artists that they work with. I mean, that's part of, that's part of the nature of their relationship mm -hmm. that they become very, very chummy with them. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that's wonderful. I also feel that that, that type of relationship can be very dangerous in the creative process because if you turn around to someone and say, yeah, but that song really sucks, you know, or, you know, you, you, this is, this could be great, but you've really got to fix it. I mean, obviously you're going to be more diplomatic than that, yeah. but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Because if you're in that position with an artist, they're obviously being vulnerable to you, showing mm -hmm. you their work. Mm -hmm. If you come at them with anything that's even remotely contentious, I'd say in about 90 to 95 cases out of 100, they're going to, you're, you're going to raise their hackles. They're going to be like, what? You know, right. like, fuck you mean, <laughs> you know, like yeah. they're going to get pissed off, even though it's like, well, I just, I happen to be doing my job right now. This is what you hired me for. Mm -hmm. You know, the truth is not always going to be so, so pleasant, you know, and we only have a certain amount of time to kind of get to the bottom of this. So we got to deal with this now, you know, obviously diplomacy plays a tremendous role in this. So you can't just be like, all right, this sucks. Like I've done that with artists when I, back in the days that I really didn't understand how to talk to people. <laughs> and I saw what kind of devastation that can wreck, yeah. you know, amongst, yeah, I mean, you can, you can basically absolutely crush a person by talking to them that way. It's just, it, it's, it's so like, it's just verboten, you know? Um, but even when you try and work around that, you're going to, you're going to ruffle people's feathers, right? you know, 
And if, but if you've established a chummy relationship with an artist, coming at, coming to them with something that's potentially very um, could be very triggering, it's you don't have the same degree of credibility. Whereas yeah. if a person is prepared for that and they know that you're that you are going to do your job and that you're not there to, that you want to be nice to them, but you're not there to be their friend, like they didn't hire me to be, you know, to, to blow smoke up their ass. You know, they yeah. hired me to help them make the best record they could make. You know, that's not achieved by being like gentle to someone and blowing smoke up their ass all the time. Sometimes you got to jerk a person around pretty hard, <laughs> not because you want to, but because the circumstance dictates it. Yeah. You know, I think being able and being, being able to present that in a way where people read about it and can see what the consequences of something like that are, as well as what the events are that lead up to making a choice like that. It's fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for this, man. I really, it's been a great, it's been a great talk. I have to say, thanks. Um, be cool to have you back when you have the books out, because I'll, I'll read them and then I can talk to them. If you have time, you probably, you know, you're busy. So, you know. No, man, it'd be great. Oh, cool, cool, thanks. But uh, what are you actually, are you reading it in cool at the moment, apart from your own stuff? Um, oh, I, I try to read my own stuff as little as possible, <laughs> only when I'm editing it. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I'm sort of like midway through probably about 10 or 15 books. Uh, oh, you're, you're like me, so I dip in and dip out. <laughs> I got ADHD. Yes, yeah, someone sent me a book um, called The... Oh, the artificial eight. That's what it is. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, um, and it's basically about the evolution of human technology, like AI. And I'm not very far into it. I have to admit, I've been sidetracked a lot. But it's really one of the most amazing books I've read in a long time. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Oh, uh, this guy make. Yeah, this guy's perspective is so extraordinary. Like how human technology developed, how certain cultures actually they're they're I can't I think there's like Tas a, a culture in Tasmania that I think doesn't is extinct now, but I think they died out in like the late set, like late nineteen early nineteenth century. Right and. They kind of their cult, their technology went backwards. They started kind of stripping away all the things that weren't necessary oh. just to be alive. Um, I think that they stopped being able to make fire because they would just carry it around with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, wow. And they didn't they didn't really wear any clothing, even though their the climate where they lived was incredibly brutal and could be in, extremely cold. They, I think they just covered themselves as like seal fat or something like that.